chat, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jenny Malloy um, from the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm afraid I cannot do justice to introduce her properly. The, the one thing that I know that, that Dr. Malloy has done is um, create the gathering for open source or open science hardware. And so this is similar to what we're doing here, but perhaps in a little bit easier um, uh, way. She's organized people to make open source science instruments. Now, why is that easier? It's easier because it doesn't have the regulation and if you make a mistake, people don't die. That's the only part of it's easier. From an intellectual point of view, it's probably not easier. But uh, from a reliability and a regulatory point of view, it might be a little bit easier. Um, so I, I probably completely butchered your um, uh, introduction, but uh, please take it away, Dr. Malloy. Not at all. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, yes, so thanks very much for the invitation. As Rob mentioned, I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge in the UK and was one of the several co-founders of the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, where we've been trying to figure out um, how to better design and um, open source documentation for scientific instruments. And I think Rob hit the nail on the head that um, we share some similarities with the goals of the open ventilator groups in that we have um, a often very complex and modular bits of hardware that require calibration and quality control that we want to get out into the world and be used and useful. But we do differ in, in the sense that a number of scientific instruments um, do not require regulation. Having said that, we do have some projects in our community that um, started off as, as sort, of, sort of research instruments, um, but are now looking to kind of what's the next step and to get accredited as medical devices. So for example, the open flexion microscope is one of those projects. Um, I also work on molecular diagnostics. I'm a biologist by background and so um, have been involved with a number of projects during COVID where people have been generating um, open source versions of COVID testing, um, which I think shares many more similarities with what the ventilator community are trying to do in terms of the challenges of moving that forward. Um, and so at times during the presentation, I'll just sort of link a little bit to kind of, if you like, the wetware side of things, as well as the hardware side of things, and what we've seen, particularly in terms of manufacturing of diagnostics in low middle income countries, which is something that I'm personally interested in through my own projects and also have been chairing a relevant um, group uh, initially as part of um, the UN Technology Bank's Technology Access Partnership, but we're, we're now a sort of more independent crowd. Um, so I'm going to share my screen if that is okay. I'm getting a host disabled participant screen sharing, unfortunately. I try again, I've now enabled you. I'm sorry, I didn't Perfect. see this. No problem, there we go. Great, so hopefully you can see that. So yeah, the title of my presentation is From Open Science to Open Medical Devices. So I'm gonna go through these three areas and kind of talk a little bit about what we've seen in open science hardware um, and where there may be some kind of similarities or tools that might be shared and useful between the two communities. And I should caveat that um, while I've been quite active on the diagnostics um, side of COVID activities and sort of tried to keep up to date with what's going on in the hardware space. Um, I haven't been actively involved in many of the ventilator communities. So really interested also in the questions to hear from you if this, if this is relevant and kind of maybe they're things you've already been trying. Um, so first of all, in terms of managing communities, I think for me, one of the most interesting parts of the sort of ventilator community and of course the, the massive surge in, in open hardware through PPE manufacturing was really like how to manage these enormous communities that are spread across the world. Um, and so again, I, I have no insights to share on how you guys have been doing it because um, I'm sort of keen to hear from you on that. But in terms of how um, the gathering for open science hardware and associated communities have worked, um, we had a much longer time period to kind of build up <laughs> our, um, our, our community and um, kind of embed sort of different levels of structure and, and coherence maybe. Um, I think that the pandemic was obviously a kind of short, sharp ne necessity for community building. So, um, but I think, I think we do share some challenges in that, which, which hardware specifically opposed to open source software has, which is 
the coordination challenge not only of people but of people and things and I think it's striking that a lot of presentations that I've seen as I've been watching in the audience today um, there of course were many international collaborations to to build ventilators but but many were kind of place-based right they were in a university because people could physically come together into physical workshops and put stuff and we also had um, obviously project at uh, Cambridge which was led out of my department here which was sort of our uh, ventilator project sorry my dog has just knocked a box off apologies <laughs> so, um, so yeah I think the people and things coordination is, is really challenging particularly when you're talking about bigger pieces of hardware for example ventilators if you're talking about kind of sensors and Arduinos those things are, are typically easier to ship to multiple teams buy multiple Arduinos and multiple sensors and send them across the world and kind of you know nav navigate through that online if you're talking about a really complex and physically quite large piece of hardware it becomes even more challenging so how do you do coordination um, and the second thing is sort of navigating different levels of resources and power and I think the number of projects that have already come up looking at LMICs how to better work with partners who where there is clearly a resource imbalance um, and potentially also a power imbalance so I think that's one of the things we've been very mindful and intentional about in the gathering for open science hardware um, and how to kind of work through that. So just to give a bit of background, this is a community that's been um, meeting in person since 2016. We also have a forum online with, I think, now around 800 members. Um, and so this is this is the last global gathering we were able to hold in Shenzhen in China in 2018. Um, and it featured people from sort of you know, all around the world, um, at least 40 countries. Um, and in our in our kind of community in general, we, we sort of span all continents and um, there are also uh, communities that I'll mention later more regionally in Latin America and Africa. And we've produced a framework for running community events, which really tries to kind of capture uh, what's special about working in person and working with hardware that some people as we the world is opening up again and things are happening might find interesting for your own um, community events um, but to, to go back to this community building the first thing that we did as a community was really come up with a manifesto and I know that also um, there's been a, a kind of a manifesto and a public um, statement put out in front in front of this conference and I think it's quite important um, for community building that people have a shared goal and purpose um, and so as we came together without a pandemic to really drive the urgency and kind of purpose of the situation was really trying to think about what does open source mean in the context of open hardware in science how does it make things different to just doing science the normal way and so I, I won't read through all of them but you can read them on our website but for example you know no black boxes having no black boxes in the lab is quite useful you understand more about the science if you understand the instrumentation um, in many fields but especially my own molecular biology we've got very used to just pressing buttons and kind of reading what's on the screen rather than understanding the instrumentation and its limitations um, and I think very relevant for this community as well is its impactful tools and allowing multiple futures for science so it wasn't just technical goals but also kind of how are we changing the system of how things are done and cultures and so I mean Greg puts this very nicely so you know we we asked we went we try and get to different locations around the world and ask what is open science hardware to you and recognize that for a lot of different places that means different things um, and so it's a very uh, we try to be quite an inclusive community and really sort of see what's um, what's most needed in a research setting in a science setting in different parts of the world um, the second thing that we did as a community was take those values and then apply them to have a roadmap going forward. So what do we need to make open science hardware ubiquitous by 2025 was the goal that we eventually settled on. Um, and I think uh, you can read the roadmap again on our website. <clears throat> and we really came up with three main areas So kind of learning about open science hardware. And, and the ways in which it, it could impact society. And I think kind of being maybe a few years older than the ventilator community, I think it's something that um, is really is really useful to have people in your communities that also want to study communities and kind of figure out what's going well, what's going badly, kind of have a maybe a step back and objective view. We have a number of social scientists that kind of work on the mechanics and, and kind of how the collaborations work. And I, I'm sure that there are many, many papers pending on kind of the, the, the ventilator um, projects and, and other activities in this community. But I think it's important to kind of learn from what we've been doing, how to support individuals um, and, and create those partnerships. 
and how to grow. So how to kind of grow with respect to diversity and, and kind of scale the community in different ways. And um, so within each of these, we came up with kind of specific ideas of what we want to achieve. And we're now moving through them. Um, a lot of that was around kind of relating better to policymakers and kind of particularly science funders and, and others. I think we've sort of heard in the last panel that funding is is, is key, <laughs> getting things moving forward. And particularly for those who want to embed open source into their projects, the best way if you're an, at an institution of not having to really fight and advocate for open source is if your funder has said in the grant agreement that it has to be open source. That makes life a lot easier for everybody. So if you're interested in kind of formulating um, justifications and kind of, uh, you know, not only at like a policy level for funding, but also at individual grants, what to write, how to justify it. That's something that members of our community have been discussing for a while and people are happy to share kind of language that they've used successfully, maybe language they've used not so successfully. This is kind of an ongoing um, process. We have a whole series uh, that we did with over 20 funders um, where we talked to them about open science hardware and kind of what it meant to them. So these are just some examples, I guess, of like, how the community has progressed and how we've kind of tried to build in um, how to prioritize really what the community needs that is not just that you notice that none of this is developing specific hardware right it's creating the enabling environment for the whole community to move forward um, and so I think that's that's super important and just to highlight that we're not the only um, the only community that you might wish to know about if you don't already the open source hardware association also has a whole bunch of resources and and useful kind of information for anyone doing open source hardware um there are global communities around topics and different sorts of a different ethos for, of how we do science that may also be be worth checking out um i won't go through them all and then i mentioned already that there are two local communities uh, regional communities rather regosh in latin america and the africa open science hardware who I'm sure would be really uh, grateful and delighted to have members of the ventilator teams um, joining in as well. Because as I say, I think technically we do have some overlap in terms of the level of complexity of the projects. Um, and, and also I think a big area of overlap is how to do better documentation. <laughs> so I'm gonna move rapidly on to that area in terms of what we've sort of seen in the science space. And maybe it, maybe it chimes with you, maybe it doesn't. Um, but really, I think there's kind of the main thing to say is that there's really a growing recognition that open intellectual property or open source is, is kind of insufficient for these complex technologies and really open know how is critical as well. As a, I'm a biologist and a lot of the sorts of work that we do is, is very tacit knowledge driven. It's very kind of still skills driven. It's quite hard to codify and put down. Um, and so things that can help in this area kind of having data schema and standards even if not for kind of everything that we're sharing but at least to kind of um, make things more discoverable and i'll come on to a couple of projects in a second that are trying to do that um, having tools focused on making it easier for developers to develop the hardware and easier for people to be build the hardware that sounds obvious but actually both of those things are quite difficult to do and doing them together is even more challenging and so um you often find that you know the tools that we use for documentation right now um, are either insufficient in one or the other. Um, and so you end up with a lot of people having quite heterogeneous systems or people trying to do absolutely everything in one system and are not quite working. And I feel like um, in terms of documentation tools, um, there probably is, there, there is a lot of kind of improvement that can be done. And then tools focused on training, quality assurance and data collection. I think that's probably one of the areas where the community probably has our community has a lot more work to do um, and maybe yours as well so in terms of the data schema and standards i would highlight um, for example the open know-how project which is an open data model for sharing hardware designs and documentation online and they started really first with discoverability so how to have a kind of standardized model for um, finding open hardware projects on the internet and pulling in the information so that you can find them um, so that's, that's important. And then the next phase is kind of building on top of that. Um, and there also, there's also an initiative called Open Nowhere, which is locating manufacturing capabilities around the world. Um, and there are kind of more, if you like, formal standards that are developing around open hardware. The DINSPEC 3105 is a, is a German standard, um, which talks about open hardware documentation and kind of what makes um, open hardware open hardware. And so all of these are quite helpful to kind of 
get everybody on the same page of what, what we mean. And I'm sure you know from looking across different projects, we certainly see this in the science space, that everybody calls themselves open source, <laughs> but the kind of usefulness of their documentation has a huge spectrum. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's having some kind of level or some kind of um, benchmark can be handy in that respect. Um, tools focused on making it easier for developers to document hardware and for people to build the hardware. Um, there's a lot of work on this. I'm picking two projects just because I know them, but it's not to say that there are not many others out there. Um, but I'll, I can just highlight kind of why these two projects decided to start, <laughs> not kind of use what was already out there. Um, so on the left hand side is a project called Git Building, which is really trying to do a lot better um, around how do you build up modular hardware using a kind of simple markdown interface, um, but then have links between a lot of your kind of bill of materials and other parts of the project and kind of enables you to start off simple and then add other documentation on top. And so really sort of build up the documentation from, from smaller segments. Um, DocuBricks is an older project that had a similar idea. So having a kind of XML um, data schema for how to build up projects in a very modular way. And again, for science, this is extremely important um, that you, you kind of want, I mean, actually physically in some circumstances. So the second project here, the microcube is a microscope that is literally modules of cubes <laughs> that you build up together and reconfigure. Um, so it's really trying to solve that problem of a lot of standard documentation is really quite monolithic and thinking about how do I document this one piece? And in fact, you may want to take several modules of these things and reuse them for other purposes. So they, the, both of these projects are really trying to kind of overcome some of the, the limitations of current documentation platforms, specifically for complex scientific hardware. Although, as I say, this may also map onto the ventilator space. And I don't know what all the different ventilator projects have been using. I imagine that as many ventilator projects as there are, there's probably as many documentation systems and tools and approaches that people have been trying. So, um, and then finally, tools focused on training, quality assurance, and data collection. Um, I don't have so many good, so all the tools I just recommend mentioned are themselves open source or kind of open standards. Um, in this space, there is a little less, I mean, there are tons of generic data collection tools out there. Um, there are quite a lot of kind of training platforms. I mean, everything from Google Classroom through to a bunch of Moodle and open source platforms for, for kind of, the challenge I think is how to integrate those. And so I, I'm highlighting here Dazuki, which is a which is an industrial platform. But I just want to highlight features that they have. They're not the only people that have these and they're definitely implementable in other areas, but it's more about the approach. So the idea here is that if you're building something on the shop floor, for example, um, what you actually want are the instructions in front of you at the point at which you're doing the work. So standard work instructions that are there with pictures and also guidance. And that actually you want those same pictures and guidance to really be in the training modules. So, so they have a route by which you can kind of have all of your work instructions for building the thing and then turn those into a quiz or kind of module so that you can show that you've trained your workforce on those things. If you update the work instructions, you can push out a kind of notification to all the people that trained on that module that they need to retrain because something has changed. And the reason this is important is because these are exactly the types of things that people want to see in quality management systems, is that you've kind of version controlled all of your instructions for how to build something and all of your workforce have been trained. Um, a second thing um, is actually gathering quality assurance data as you build the thing. And so that the example screenshot on the right hand side is basically saying, here's how you check a, a thing. Here's how you check this button. Um, and then it asks you to input the data um, and then it will actually change its instructions depending on if your if your product has passed quality control or not. So it, it kind of makes sure that um, as far as possible, people are following a standard work process and not kind of deviating or cutting corners. And we use um, a, not this software, but a kind of similar um, similar system for doing our uh, bacterial expression of enzymes. Um, in our case, they're currently not for diagnostic tests, but we eventually hope to get there. So I work with a team in Cameroon. And so in Cameroon, as they're, as they're growing the bacteria to express the enzymes, they'll kind of take measurements and plug them into the system and kind of follow on. So <clears throat> how do you integrate all of that stuff is a challenge. And how do you then embed some of these data schema and standards into the tools themselves to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing? <laughs> because I think we all know that documentation is hard. We all know people don't, you know, 
don't they know the importance but actually spending time on it is another matter so there's I think there's still a lot of scope for having better tools that really try and kind of take root with some of these new improvements um, exploring what you could create with a kind of developer focus merged with a user focus um, and actually there's there's a sort of number of different documentations you need really there's the kind of like researcher developer documentation of kind of here's a thing and here's how I built it and all of the sorts of design decisions that went into that so that you know if you want to change something why or how you might change it there's a sort of manufacturer set of documentation as to here's a thing I'm assuming you're not going to change anything you just want to build it and then there's also a kind of user documentation and then potentially also a sort of service and repair documentation so it's kind of thinking about all of these different types and then uh, kind of, again, embedding quality assurance and calibration into that documentation and you know, what are the unit tests for open hardware that we could do. Um, and I'll finish on quality. I actually only have one slide for this because um, it's really hard and I don't think there are any clear answers. So we heard a lot about this in, in the last panel, so I won't, I'll just highlight a couple of um, aspects of that. So if you're, the real difference between building something that's going to be used in a research laboratory and building something that's going to be used um, in a medical device is basically quality, maintaining it and re reproducing it across every each and every single device. Um, and so, I mean, we, as you're all probably all aware, one of the main kind of standards for quality of medical devices is the ISO 13485 standard. Um, and so this is something that is effectively, it's a whole system of how you run your uh, design and production and follow-up processes so it's not just kind of having the technology working and it's not even just repeatedly being able to make the technology time and time again with no problems but it's also when you put it out into the markets having follow-up with anybody downstream who had problems distributors customers um, patients everything like that so there's a whole bunch of kind of um, requirements around ISO 13485 and regulatory systems um, that are just really hard and not really um, what R&D people think about. And so one question is how to like, how can you best undertake your research and development and actually building the tech um, so that it's easier to move into a manufacturing quality management system? Um, and that's something that uh, the working group that I briefly mentioned in my introduction are thinking of exploring this year, along with a diagnostics platform at the University of Cape Town is basically we're thinking more about molecular diagnostic um, developers, so people building lateral flow assays or PCR tests that everybody is now familiar with after two years of taking them. Um, but how do you kind of do the R&D in such a way that there's a more seamless transition um, and things are not having to be replicated maybe quite so much as it moves into a quality management system, because quite often things just get completely redone. Um, the second thing is kind of opportunities for opening up more knowledge, know-how and documentation for how to actually do a quality management system. We talk, we, we've talked a lot today about LMIC manufacturers and particularly when I was working with the United Nations Technology Access Partnership, the questions that we got from LMIC manufacturers around diagnostics were pretty much all about quality. Like how do we how do we do quality management in the diagnostic space? Who can advise us on that? Who can help us? Because there are a ton of consultants out there um, they are not cheap, obviously, um, and also kind of locating the right people and particularly people who have any background in LMIC manufacturing is really hard. So, um, so I think that's that's sort of one one area of kind of and I saw someone commenting in the Zoom chat that one group had kind of shared their regulatory paperwork and, and documentation. And so I think sort of more guidance around how to actually build this stuff up for, in, in the open would be really nice. A lot of it is either you pay consultants to do it or it's hidden within businesses and industries that for obvious reasons are not making all of that open. So I think the more that people can, can kind of contribute to that side, the more um, we can move this towards kind of actually getting out into the world, still gonna be very expensive. Um, and yeah, if the goal is production at LMICs, how to build quality management into systems that are fit for context. I mentioned that just because my previous slides all mentioned super duper electronic internet connected and enabled um, kind of solutions. And certainly my team in Cameroon, some of the choices that we've made have, have basically been, can we use this offline? <laughs> so we know for sure that we're not gonna have a constant internet connection. We're not gonna have constant electricity connection. And so, and so the, uh, some, of the, some of the challenges that are faced on top of doing stuff um, in, a, in a kind of higher income environment where you know that's gonna be steady is that a lot of the tools that are perhaps affordable and built for purpose are 
depend on being connected to the cloud at all times. And so, so there are sort of some, some technical challenges there. And yeah, finally, it's really expensive. I mean, quality for make quality is expensive full stop, whether it's for a research microscope or a microscope that's going to be used in malaria diagnosis to take the um, open flexioscope example. Quality for regulated medical products is even more so. Um, you know, how do you fund not only the setting up of the quality management system, but the maintenance of it? And that continuous kind of follow up of all the downstream users and you know there's a there's a lot to it and I think that's all of this slide is basically what a lot of people I've spoken to around open source diagnostics and I am assuming that similar is true in the ventilator community of kind of like but the tech works yes <laughs> we know the tech works and that's an important part but kind of all of this follows and it's is much more time consuming and expensive than I ever thought it was before I sort of ended up getting a little bit more knowledgeable about this space. Um, and so it's it's super important, but super difficult to kind of figure out how to take these amazing open source solutions and kind of find that market opportunity and find that manufacturer and find those um, kind of patient funding sources that will get you all the way through to having a medical device out there. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, there are definitely some connections that to be made between the open source, open science hardware community and um, the ventilator community and others that are represented here at Respiricon. And so, yeah, I'd welcome you to check out the websites that I linked to. I'll make these slides available in the chat and, and online. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. So please type your questions into the Q&A thing. I have like 60 questions for Dr. Malloy, but um, let me let me just begin. So first of all, let me say that um, uh, Public Invention uh, has started a license called the Sunlight Regulatory License, which is designed to pry open um, FDA and other regulated applications. I was unaware of the thing you say that anyone had done it. As far as I know, it, most of them are hidden. And I think that needs to change. We need to create a culture where some fraction, not all of the parts of it, but some part of the those applications are made available to, to people. And that can be done with a legal license. Your concept of unit test for hardware is incredibly important. I would actually commend the British government, believe it or not, for their standard for rapidly manufactured ventilation devices, which is not in play right now, but was at the very beginning of the pandemic. They sort of did that in the sense that they, they had very well documented tests and expectations of what they insisted that the machine would do. I think as a community, we can grow into that in certain ways. It will always be harder than unit tests because it will always take a certain amount of human labor, whereas automated software unit tests, you just push a button and it gets done for you. But uh, nonetheless, I think we can achieve it. Um, I was excited by you um, talking about standards. And by the way, that's one thing I think the open source software community does incredibly well. It sounds like you're doing it very well as well. Um, I'm proud of the very non-glamorous work that Public Invention has done. We have created a respiration data standard and a respiration control standard, um, which are actually used in this device and a couple of others. So although nobody who doesn't know me personally has used those data standards, so I can't say they're widespread, they are published standards used by several uh, other people. We have a question here from Azad Mashari. Any work in the open science hardware world on developing an OS documentation system that would support creating an ISO 13485 compliant quality system? No, not that I'm aware of, but again, I think there's a shared interest um, and certainly that that will be something if people in this community want to work towards, I think would be, would be really helpful. I mean, I'm definitely in position with certain projects of mine that we're working with um, consultants to get a basic kind of platform a basic system set up for for reagent manufacturing and um would hope to then kind of share what we have with others but i think definitely not in terms of taking through and i said 13 for five like it's not a fun bedtime read <laughs> it's a very it's a very long standard it takes a lot i i mean i've i haven't yet been through that process but i have got a non-profit that's iso 9001 certified and so i kind of have some experience of, of sort of going through the ISO audits and, and certification. Um, and, you know, it's it's tough. I think the more more help we can give each other, particularly as a lot of the times um, the the companies that are trying to commercialize open source technologies tend to be the smaller ones who need the most help. 
Okay, um, so uh, Dr. Malloy, um, T Flat Platform Africa has asked four questions in the Q and A thing. Before you go to Rehive, could you attempt to type in answers to those those questions? Um, I'm afraid I don't have time to allow you to uh, ask that live. Oh, this gentleman is Nyakan June, or maybe a uh, lady. Um, uh, so uh, could you try to answer those questions, please? I have a question I really am dying to ask you, but I can't because I don't have time. Um, <laughs> That's fine. So yeah, sorry. I, I will, I will um, be around on Rehive. Um, for, yeah, for hopefully we can, those of us who didn't get our questions answered, and I want to thank you very much. I intend to take some inspiration from the open science hardware community and learn from it and try to make the open medical technology community uh, achieve some of the things that you've done. And I think you've made it more fun than we have. Um, possibly that's because there's more overlap between people's normal jobs and what they're doing in your project than there is for most of our engineers who, who don't have an overlap there. But none, nonetheless, um, I bet we can learn from you. Uh, my apologies, Nyakan, uh, uh, for misgendering you. Um, so if you could uh, uh, try to answer those questions, that would be very um, helpful.